A deep darkness loomed above him, seeming like an endless abyss that he might accidentally fall into if he wasn't careful. However, in reality, it was just a very high ceiling in his unlit room, so far above him that it remained out of sight as he stared upwards. Still, he felt himself being pulled towards it. Of course, he knew that was just a feeling, but that didn't help him shake it in the slightest. The darkness looked empty. Calm. Comforting. He had done little but stare into it since the day he had held his speech, and with it, sent his call for help out to the galaxy. Many things must have happened since then, he was sure. A reaction from humanity. Outcries from different worlds. Outreaching from multiple news organisations at the very least. But he was kept in the dark about it. The only reason he knew it was happening was that there was absolutely no possibility that it wasn't. Still, he was kept in the dark, as someone dealt with it in his stead. His instructing had also been put on hold for the moment, likely because his instructors had their hands full with the fallout of the recent announcements. All the better for him. It left more time for him to gaze into the darkness, trying to let his mind be consumed by it. That way, he didn't have to deal with his own failure, and that was just it. He had failed them. He failed to keep them safe by playing along, simply because he could no longer bear it. Failed to save them from a danger they were only in because he had failed to get them off the station and out of danger earlier. Because he had failed to use his opportunity on the station, wasting time with imbecilic plans implanted into him during his darkest times, which he had failed to resist. And all because he had failed to see what was happening to them before it was too late. A perfect storm of his own failures, and the only one who likely wouldn't be suffering from it was himself. Yeah. He would take the darkness over that, even if he felt himself slowly withering away all the while. His limbs, the ones that remained at least, hurt from their lack of use, his muscles screaming to be exercised and kept from their imminent atrophy. But James didn't care for it. If his actions were what caused the situation, then he'd rather remain inactive from now on. But even this comfort was taken from him before too long. Slowly, but to his sound-deprived ears also very loudly, the door to his room was opened. Strange. A single thought pierced his weary mind. It shouldn't be time for any meals yet. In fact, he wasn't sure what time it was at all. But it had to be late, because even though the door was opened almost all the way, the light entering the room through it was a soft silver glow instead of the blinding rays of vicious starlight that usually assaulted his eyes every time it was opened. Was it night outside? When was the last time he had even seen a night? Despite his soft glow, the light was enough to chase away the comforting darkness, revealing the room's ceiling to him as a hazy outline that wasn't able to grasp his focus like the absence of light. His human nature taken over for a second before he could stop himself, he turned his head in a fit of anger to see who had come to disturb him. After all this time, the sight of the high matriarch barely even gave him a quick jolt of horror anymore. It was like a jump scare in a movie, there and then over, leaving no lasting impact. Maybe exposure therapy worked. Or maybe even his misguided survival instincts couldn't be bothered anymore. He didn't know. As she noticed him looking at her, Tua stared back at him expectantly. However, James just turned his head away. Of course, this didn't dissuade his captor in the slightest, and he could hear her heavy steps approach him almost immediately. It made him wonder what she was here for. It had been a while since she had personally come to see him. She was quite good at delegating all of her work to lackeys. Maybe... This was the moment she told him that his actions had consequences. Maybe, now he would be sure that it was all over. Within him, a power struggle between his old and new headspace began. The need to know, against him not wanting to know. And in the end, something happened that surprised even himself. What do you want? He asked, irritated. Before his mind could even catch up to what his tongue was doing. I have been reading, James. To it informed him as she arrived at his bedside. One half of her trunk lowered in his direction, rubbing across his head, and stroking through his hair. He had given up pulling away from the Zoditus attempt at uh, contact a while ago. It was over quicker if he just ignored it. Reading? James asked, confused by the disconnectedness of that statement, enough so that it forced him to inquire further. Yes, James, reading, Tua said in a high, elated tone, and chuckled to herself. Wouldn't hurt you to try and do that again from time to time? She took a moment to really let the condescension in that statement take hold, flushing her ears loudly, filling the void before she finally continued. More precisely, I'll be reading for the human net, keeping up with their news cycle, you could say. Many of them don't have nice words for you. I was willing to hear what you have to say. However, there was one thing they all seemed to be in agreement over. His heart skipped a beat. Of course, humans had picked up on his message. It was unavoidable. 
He knew this moment was coming, but he still wasn't ready for it. With his mouth feeling as dry as a desert, he slowly forced his words out. And... And what's that? He averted his eyes, but forced himself to keep them open. He wouldn't shut his eyes to what he had done, even if it took every last bit of his remaining willpower to do so. Tua took a long moment, clearly reveling in the tension she created. Finally, she slowly and purposefully cleared her throat, and as she began to speak, James couldn't hold any longer and his eyes shut tight in anticipation. Delightedly, she said, You look terrible, James. A moment of silence. James's eyes remained squeezed shut for a few seconds longer, as his mind only very slowly caught up to what his ears had just heard. Hesitantly, he opened them back up and cautiously looked over at the colossal frame of the High Matriarch. What? he asked, unsure if he had understood her correctly. Terrible, James, you look terrible. Tua quickly replied to him with a trumpeting laugh. At least that's how the human newsletters describe you. Haggard, tired, near maddened, or unkempt, just to name a few. And honestly, I can't say I disagree with them. James was still flabbergasted. Was that really all she was here for? I... what? He repeated himself. His warm brain unable to process anything else of his expectations for the moment. Tua shook her head slightly, looking down on him in a faint disapproval. You need to take better care of yourself, James. She admonished him in a high, sweet tone that was so far from actually sounding caring as it could be. You want to represent your people, after all. So you need to show yourself at your best. Eventually, and far later than he should have, even James began to catch up to what was going on. And quickly, his mind snapped back onto his old rail. Sure, I'll get to that tomorrow, he dismissed, turning away from Tua. Although through the gloom and doom of his mind, a single bright thought pierced through. Surely if he had messed up enough to get someone killed, Tua would have reveled in letting him know as much. That meant, at least for the moment, everyone was still safe. Is that a promise? Tua asked in a childish manner, rolling each letter in her throat, making her sound like an overgrown and very ugly pigeon. Bugger off, James grumbled with a sigh, baring his teeth despite not looking at her. However, suddenly, he found himself being pulled around, as one half of Tua's trunk grabbed onto his shoulder and yanked on it, forcing him to roll over and look her in the face once again. He stared at her enormous visage, losing the thread for a moment as his dark eyes found hers and, for a second, a flash of his former fear returned. Even just compared to her head alone, he felt small, as he lay there, grabbed by her trunk, and surrounded by her enormous tusks. That wasn't a request, James, she said in the sharp tone, and pinned him with the gaze of her six eyes. Now that you've presented yourself, people are going to want to talk to you, and we can't have you looking like a sleepless madman for that. Do I make myself clear? James stared back at her with wide eyes, feeling his jaw quiver as he forcibly tried to find his voice. Transparently. He finally managed to press out through shaking lips. Even after he had answered, they remained like that for a few seconds. Then, finally, she let go of his shoulder, allowing him to scurry away from her. Wonderful, she cheered, once again chipper as a first grader. I'm looking forward to seeing you in your old glory soon. With heavy steps and happily waving her trunk, she turned around and left his room, leaving him alone with his thoughts. Once his heart had recovered from the roller coaster of multiple shocks and reliefs in quick succession, James wanted to try and fall back into the darkness underneath the ceiling. However, he could still hear his heart beating in his ears. He felt it beating against his chest, filling him with a nervous energy that ran through him like an electric current, looking for a release. And his mind filled his ears with a constant, so, and his vision of the darkness above with white dots and swirls that he knew couldn't be there. He didn't know if it was the rush of his remaining fear, or maybe the wave of relief still washing over him, knowing that his worst fears hadn't become reality just yet. Most likely it was a mix of both. All he knew is that it filled him with something that he hadn't felt in a while. He felt that he needed to get up. Not out of a bodily necessity or a vague drive or obligation to do so to fulfil some predestined tasks. He just couldn't lie still anymore. This tempestuous energy that had been churned up inside him needed a release, and it would absolutely not be ignored, no matter how hard he tried. Finally, and only when he felt that his heart would try and break out of his ribcage if he didn't do anything right that second, he swung his legs around and jumped out of his bed. The sudden exertion and extreme movement made him woozy for a moment as he landed. However, he could feel his body send jolts of involuntary excitement through him as soon as he had gotten on his feet. Just minutes, and 649 steps later, he found himself in front of the huge door that led into the enormous fenced-in yard behind the estate. As every door around, it was far too big for him to open, and as every exit, 
He was guarded by two Zodaitos, who looked at him in a mixture of distrust and endearment. Looking up at the dark, polished and shiny finished wood, he couldn't quite comprehend why his feet had carried him there. However, they weren't done yet. He didn't even know if he had permission to go into the yard. Despite it being completely walled in, it was still outside. However, he stepped in front of the guards confidently, and looked up at them with the same tired but driven way he always did, when he needed one of the insurmountable gates open for him by one of the colossi. And indeed, it was open for him. The door made way for the dimly illuminated greenery outside, and before he even really knew what he did, James stepped outside. His quick and determined steps only came to a halt once he heard the door slam behind him heavily. He stood for a moment, just feeling the night in his skin. It was warm. Damp. Tropical in a way. A soft breeze brushed over him, chilling his skin and rustling through his hair. Eagerly and almost entirely on their own, his lungs filled with the thin but still fresh air surrounding him. He looked down at the hairs on his arm, standing up in the cooling wind. This was the first time he had been outside in, well, basically forever. After all, he had spent even the months before his capture on ships and stations. And that even though he used to be such an outside person. And although his mind was still weary, his body clearly remembered this feeling all on its own. His legs moving by themselves once again, he stepped away from the estate's walls and out into the field of greenery, off the beaten path leading through it. Although it was the middle of the night, with the planet's star not anywhere in sight, it was illuminated bright enough that his darkness accustomed eyes could see clear as day. The ground was covered in thick, moss-like plants that formed a puffy net of string or wall-like leaves, which made walking on it feel extremely cushiony. Around him stood enormous trees that he could only compare to redwood in his mind, due to their sheer size alone, although their bark was a bluish colour with dark stripes like that of birches, and their build reminded a lot more of a massive oak or maybe beech. Looking up, he could see their long, four-lobed leaves that also had a slight blue hue to them, as well as something that looked like fruits, big as the size of his head, if not bigger. However, his eyes didn't stick to them for long, as they wanted further and further up. Until now, he had thought that there were lights in the the garden during the night, now he realised that wasn't necessary. The sky was dotted over and over and over with countless stars, nebulas and other celestial bodies. There were more white dots and colours in the sky than black empty space, turning the night to day. He couldn't even make out a moon, just stars. So, this was the nice sky of a core world. Seeing it, he almost understood why one would think highly of themselves if they came to be in a place like this. Almost. Awestruck, James couldn't stop looking up, and slowly he sank down to the ground laying down in the woolly moss and staring up into space. The aura and wonder it filled him with wasn't enough to keep the dark thoughts from entering his mind for all too long, and all too soon, he found himself back in his worry that any day now, Tua would get to read an article about the encoded message in the ambassador's speech. But still, as an abyss to stare into, the void made for a suitable substitute for the darkness of his room. At least, his body seemed satisfied with allowing him to keep lying there this time. A nudge against his arm awoke him from his slumber. He slowly opened his eyes, but quickly squeezed them shut again, as the brutal light of the planet's star blinded him. The day was already starting to get hot, and he could feel the assault of harmful rays rain down onto his sensitive skin, without any sunscreen in sight. With a groan, he pushed himself off the ground with his left arm, opening his eyes in small slits to try and see anything around him. He could hear somebody scurry a few steps away from him, and looking in the direction of the noise, he could make out a silhouette of somebody against the blinding light. He sat up, lifting his arm to shield his eyes from the star. Now, after a few seconds of blinking, he slowly started to make out some more details. In the heat of the day, he could smell an odour like cut grass in the air, and the plants beneath him had become significantly drier in the heat. So he looked up at who had so rudely awoken him. It wasn't anybody he had met before, but that wasn't all too surprising. This wasn't the first time a strange being he had never seen had woken him up during his time here. They were an overall small person, not much bigger than himself. The form was that of a flying reptile with six eyes, with their mouth formed to a wide snout beak. James estimated their wingspan to be somewhere in the eight meters, and their wings seemed extremely specialized to the point where he could barely make out their hands anymore. Right now, they stood up extremely straight and looked down at him from above with a curious gaze. Anything I can help you with? James asked as the stranger remained silent while still squinting up at them and trying to get used to the light. Again, the stranger didn't reply just turning their head every which way to look at him with as many of their eyes as possible. James groaned. Any reason you've woken me up? He asked annoyed and looked at them sternly. Again, no answer. 
Now he was really getting annoyed. In a quick motion, he pushed himself off the ground, jumping to his feet and loudly saying, Look, if Tua wants anything from me, then... However, he stopped, because as soon as he had gotten up, the person immediately jumped, backing away from him even further with a few frantic flaps of their wings and letting out a small screech. Had he startled them that much? They came to a halt about five metres away from him, and once again looked at him with a mixture of tentativeness and curiosity. James lifted an eyebrow and tilted his head to the side. What was up with them? By now, his eyes had gotten used to the harsh light around him, and he managed to catch their gaze. And looking into their eyes, he saw... nothing. There wasn't a thought behind them. You're not sapient, are you? He asked the creature in front of him, feeling not just a little foolish that he had just tried to have a conversation with an animal. The more the absurdity hit him, the more he chuckled to himself, although he couldn't fault himself all that much. If I only talked, this creature would certainly not have been too out of place in the galactic community, not any more than many other species he knew anyway. The creature replied to his inquiry with a hesitant cooing sound, and James wanted to take a closer look at it. However, the second he took one step towards it, the animal decided that it had decidedly had enough of this strange alien in his territory, and the large flyer took off with a screech, kicking up a pretty strong wind as it lifted itself off the ground with a few beats of his mighty wings. James shielded his face from the flow of air, and followed his path through the sky with his gaze, watching it take a wide bow around to almost the entirety of the massive garden, before it finally settled down on one of the branches high up in one of the enormous trees, making it shake up and down with loudly rustling leaves, as the creature put all of its weight on the wood. A few of the leaves actually shook loose from the branch, and James watched them as they slowly danced in the wind and descended towards the ground in flips and twirls, before finally landing in the comparatively small stream, flowing through the garden at an even pace, causing gentle ripples to spread out across its surface. He was ready to watch them float down the stream's path, however they weren't floating for long. Only seconds after they had hit the water's surface, something quickly appeared from beneath, putting the leaves under in the blink of an eye, with a loud and flashy splash. James could feel his eyes widen slightly, and he took another gaze up. If there were giant reptiloids flying around here instead of birds, then what was there in the water? He never even realised it, but he hadn't felt this curious in a long while not even close to it. He closed the distance to the stream within seconds, running a bit as he felt too impatient to walk, and standing at the bank of the stream, he looked down into the almost crystal clear water. He went to his knees, ripping out some of the woolly moss and throwing it into the water. Again, it didn't take long for something to take interest, and quickly, a large form, at least the size of a huge carp, shot up from the depths and lunch of the plants, pulling them under with another splash. And although he had only gotten a quick glance at it, James was pretty sure that his eyes had not deceived him, and he reached for his forehead, stroking the long hair out of his face as he laughed in disbelief. That's a placoderm, he thought to himself, following the outline of the heavily armoured fish-like being. Of course, intellectually, he knew that this animal had nothing to do with the long extinct fish that used to inhabit Earth's waters millions of years ago, and had just been similarly built by evolution. But still, it couldn't quite shake his excitement. And if he was honest with himself... That it was a being that evolved millions of kilometres away from his home, instead of millions of years out of his time, didn't exactly make it a lot less exciting. Either way, it hit him that this was something that wasn't meant to be seen by human eyes, that likely no human had ever seen before him, or at least very few. Immediately, his mind began to race. What niche did this animal fill? Did it live here naturally, or was it put there by the personnel of the estate? What purpose did that armour fill? And was it a characteristic of the fish on this planet? Or was it something special and exotic? Then, right after, he thought about sequencing the being's genetic code, trying to decipher what gave it its attributes, and in what way that responded to its surroundings. Of course, he had no idea about the code this world used, and he would likely not be able to decipher anything out of it without help, but he immediately wanted to try. Sequencing an animal from another world, just a short while before his worth, that would have been a wacky pipe dream for the people within his field, and he was standing right here in front of it. In the middle of high walls of stone, steel and concrete, keeping him trapped in this place under the dark threat of hurt and death come to those dear to him, he stood before somebody's dream, the dream of many. A completely new frontier, at least for his people. The thought finally brought him back to reality, and he turned his head, looking back at the estate. This really wasn't the time to get all excited like a little boy. Lives were on the line, and not just those of his friends. Whether they knew it or not, the galaxy was nearing a turning point, and the future was yet to be determined and, although not by his own choice, he was standing right in the thick of it. He looked back down at the water for a moment. On top of the water's current, he could make out his mirror image, warped and bent out of shape, 
but still undeniably there. His hand once again reached for the empty space that once used to be his arm. He remembered the regret he had felt right after he had made his call for help, and that had haunted him so deeply, especially during the last night. And he denounced it. Denounced his regret, denounced his inaction. He was dumb, just letting things happen to him. He didn't know what his fellow humans would do now that they knew about him. But whatever it was, he decided that when they came, they would come to find James Aldwin, and not just what was left of him. And his captors? Well, if they wanted James Aldwin, he would give him to them as well. Hyphatine Reprieve stepped out into the bright light of day, the rice sweeping around the enclosed area of the estate's backyard. Are you sure he's out here? Reprieve questioned his colleague, sounding more annoyed to be out here at all than actually doubtful of that claim. He stuck his crutch into the ground, leaned on it heavily while he looked over the greenery one more time with a bored expression, scratching along his trunk with his right hand. It is the last place he has been seen, and no guards have let him back inside yet. Hyphatine replied with a slightly indignant intonation, and some of her many flexible arms crossed each other while others made wide gestures towards the surrounding area. So he is either out here, or he has spontaneously combusted overnight, or maybe he has learned to walk through walls. Reprie could only conjure up a very tired smile towards her attempt at comedy. Then he looked up to the star, which was nearing its apex in the sky by now. And he's been out here all night? He asked, shielding his eyes from the harmful rays with one arm as he squinted skywards. Who knows, maybe he climbed out of here. Wouldn't surprise me when it comes to him. Hyphity scoffed at him. Death or not, he can't scale those walls. Without help, there's no getting it or out of this place for a human, and they don't have the tools for it. Besides, the cameras outside would have picked him up immediately, she explained confidently. I looked around one more time. Hiding around here, on the other hand, well, that is a different story. Oh well, we'll just have to find him. Reprieve looked over at her in a bit of surprise. What makes you think he's hiding? He asked, while hazing up his colleague's pearly white face. Hyphity just gestured towards the mostly open field of the yard, interrupted mostly by the enormous Ziffliar trees decorating it sporadically. Do you see him anywhere? She asked sarcastically, and continued without waiting for an answer. Well, I don't either. I noted to any of the guards looking out here earlier, and even if we're a bit larger than the two of you, it's not like we'd just overlook him. But if it or not, people actually know how to look down. Now it was Reprieve's turn to scoff. A bit larger was putting it lightly, especially with the Zoditos. Also, he still wasn't convinced. Just remaining unobserved wasn't hiding, after all. Hiding would mean one actually didn't want to be found. Let's put your theory to the test, shall we? He suggested, with a challenging nod of his head. Be my guest, Ivety replied, sweeping one of her thin arms widely in a whatever kind of gesture. She looked down at him in anticipation, clearly expecting him to pick up his crutch and to start limping around the backyard while looking around for James, like the guards had done before him. But he didn't have the human's impeccable eyesight and wasn't counting on seeing any more than the ones before him had. However, so far, people had only looked for James, and Reprieve knew the guards of the estate pretty well by now. They were loyal and dutiful to a T when it came to fulfilling the tasks given to them, however, they were also very literal. If they were told to go look for him, they would do exactly that. Not because they were dumb, per se, just because that is what they had been taught and paid to do for a long time. So instead of limping around laboriously and making a fool of himself, Reprieve just pushed himself up from his crutch ever so slightly, and loudly called out, You aren't going to make a handicapped man drag himself around to look for you, are you, James? And Reprieve smirked, as the answer came near instantly. If it handicaps you so much, just get a new leg already, James's voice echoed towards them, sounding like it came from a good distance away, as well as from above? Despite the unexpected direction, Reprieve gave a quick sideways glance towards Hyphati, and enjoyed the annoyed look in her eyes. Although he probably wouldn't admit it directly to her face, he did quite enjoy how much their positions had reversed since the time of the GES. And it had only taken him getting nearly fatally wounded to achieve this. Only after he had gotten his satisfaction did he start to look up, trying to find just what the freak had gotten up to this time. James made it a bit easier on him as he continued on with his mockery. I know someone who'd be glad to make one for you. They're an expert at it. He kept on rambling, allowing Reprieve to slowly figure out his position over the span of a few seconds, Although, you'd need to get them out of the cell you're holding them in first. Also, they probably want an apology for you trying to kill them, but at least they could also make me an arm while they're at it. He was surprisingly talkative today, much more than he had been in the last days or even weeks. At least this meant he was a lot easier to find. Finally, Reprise's eyes landed on the pale, hairless form wrapped in cloth. The primate, doing his ancestors proud, sat high up in one of the Ziphar trees. 
From the looks of it, he must have been at least 10 metres above the ground, although that was admittedly a very conservative estimate, and James likely sat much higher than even that. The primate leaned against the tree's trunk, balancing in his sole hand one of the Ziphar fruits responsible for the tree's name. The fruit looked colossal next to the human, yet he held it without much effort with just his one hand, and had clearly already taken multiple bites out of it. Very funny, Reprieve replied to him, and tired of yelling everything. He now actually pulled his crutch out of the ground and started slowly walking towards the tree. But this is the much preferable option and I get by just fine. And clearly, so do you. How did you even get up there? James was clearly confident in continuing this vapid chain of nonsense with him. However, it was only now that Hyphity also spotted the human. And she had a very different idea. James, what are you doing up there? She yelled out, both shocked and authoritative, as if she wanted to ask and scold him at the same time. James indicated a shrug. Although one arm of his was occupied and the other was missing, so it remained at an implication. I got hungry, he said in a nonchalant manner. And as if to demonstrate this fact, he took another bite out of the Ziphyar. And I remembered these were edible from the GES, so I climbed up here and got one. Reprieve snorted. Absolutely no regard for his safety. And at this point, why would he have? Hyphity seemed to be overtaxed by the situation for a second. Her constant fantasizing about death orders was one thing, but seeing that these agents of chaos did what they did, literally just because, was a whole different story. Still, she quickly snapped out of it again. Well, get down from there, she ordered, the bright spot in her eyes narrowing. James looked down at her, and for a second, a fish sharpness flashed over his face, although it didn't hold long enough to tell if it was maybe just imagination. In the blink of an eye, his face had bellowed out again, and he once again indicated a shrug. With a lazy movement of his arm, that looked like little more than a wave of his hand. He tossed the huge fruit he was holding away, sending it flying through the air before it landed precisely in the water of the stream, throwing through the garden. Almost immediately, hungry residents of the stream started devouring the unexpected treat, and in the meantime, James pushed himself up from his sitting position. Since Reprieve had seen the freak jump down a building before, it wasn't much of a shock for him to see the primate climb along the tree's bark with reckless abandon. In with just one hand, he barely held on for more than a split second, getting him in momentum and only rarely breaking his fall as he descended the Ziphyar, barely inconvenienced by the planet's gravitational pull. The last few measures, he simply jumped, landing in the cushiony Sephith, covering most of the ground with a roll that looked more instinctual than wanted in its exertion. So, what do you want? James asked, just moments after he had landed. However, before anyone even had the chance to reply, he glanced upwards at the burning sun above them. They seemed to have no intention of letting his assault any time soon, and he groaned. Actually, let's discuss this inside. This heat is getting unbearable. Shortly thereafter, they were already inside, enjoying the relative coolness of the last stone walls. In the meantime, James had already drunk an amount of water that was hard to believe actually fit inside him somehow. And now he listened to them while performing some form of exercise that involved pushing himself off the ground with his arm repeatedly. Despite the low gravity, it made him break quite the sweat, which was likely due to a combination of the temperature, and it not being meant to be performed with one arm. We're expecting contact any day now. Honestly, it is surprising that there has been nothing so far, but it is also not unheard of, especially considering Earth isn't exactly unified yet. Your nations are still coordinating with each other before returning to the community with a response. So, in the meantime, we've organised some more meetings for you. Now that the first excitement has started to die down, there are some prominent figures quite interested in having words with you, and we'll be going over a detailed list later, so please be ready to... Is this really necessary? Hyperty interrupted her briefing on the upcoming events with a sigh, her eyes following the primate pushing himself up and down over and over again, which had to be taken up at least some part of his focus. It is, James replied, between deliberate breaths he took with each push. Orders from the High Mayshark. Told me to make myself presentable and she sounded like she was very serious. I'm not taking chances with this one. You're just being a nuisance, Reprieve immediately accused him, leaning against the wall so he could let go of his crush for a while and rest his hand and arm. That too, James immediately admitted, without a second thought. Well, anyway, Hyphity continued, shaking her head in annoyance, although her tone still mellowed out slightly. Reprieve noticed that she threw him a sideways glance for a second. As I was saying, we'll go over the notable personalities and some of the points that he discussed with them later. It shouldn't be a big problem for you, but don't take it lightly. We have great confidence in your performance and the effect it could have. So don't mess around. Are we clear? Transparently, James replied immediately, but while stopping his exercise for a moment and hopping into a kneeling position from which he looked up at Hyphity's striking blue eyes. Anything else? There it was again, the quick flash of viciousness over his face, gone almost as soon as it appeared. Nothing right now, Hyphity informed him, and she seemingly was in a hurry to wrap things up all of a sudden, 
We'll come back later for the extended briefing. Please finish your exercise by then. I want you to focus on that. Without another word, or waiting for a confirmation from the freak, she turned and walked towards the door at a brisk pace, leaving Rapree to awkwardly limp after her in surprise. Just as the door was closed behind them, you can help but notice a sound coming out of the cell. It was muffled by the door on the stone walls, but it was quite telling. The sound was that of a fist heavily hitting against the side of the stone floor or one of the walls. The impact honestly sounded painful. He couldn't think about that for long, however, because he nearly ran into Hyferty, who was suddenly stopped before him. Hey, warn me if you do that, he bitterly complained playfully. It hurts running into your place, you know. But Hyferty didn't appear to be in the mood for his banter. You really don't mind this at all, do you? She asked. Her voice turned to a low hum. Rapik confusedly wiggled his trunk and looked at her hesitantly. You're going to need to be more specific than that, he informed her, as he really did have no clue what she was referring to. Working with him, she replied immediately. You used to be upset by it, by just his presence. I remember you having nightmares from a close encounter with him, but now you don't seem to be upset at all. I seem to be more upset by it than you are. Rapri walked around the still frame of his colleague to get a look at her face. Her eyes glanced down at him as he walked into their field of view, but she didn't move much more than that. It? He once again asked for clarification. He took your leg, Rapri! She suddenly burst out, turning towards him in a snap and staring intently, the bright dots in her eyes narrowing to pinpricks. He could have killed you, and I am furious about that. I managed to keep myself composed, but by the will, it makes me angry. So why does it seem like the same isn't true for you? It's not needed for our work that I get angry, Rapri replied dismissively, but Hyfty wasn't having it. I don't care about the work, she rebuffed in agitation, her voice breaking out into a concerto of noise. I am asking you, why are you not at least upset? Rapri was taken aback by her outbreak. Had this been gnawing on her that much? Conciliatorily, he put a hand on her armoured waist and looked up at her meekly. Honestly, I can't quite tell you. Wish I could, but the truth is, I'm just not... And I don't know why, he explained slowly. Not even satisfied with that answer himself, but he didn't have another one. However, he didn't want to leave it at that, so he added, Honestly, I don't know if I should be surprised or moved that you seem to care so much. Hyferty, slowly coming down from her earlier break, strummed amusedly. Are you kidding? If he wasn't so important, I'd have torn him limb from limb for that. He should be thankful that it was just an arm, she said, in a simultaneously grim and humorous tone. Rapri's eyes widened a bit. Well... Now I'd like to see you try, he mocked his non deaf old colleague, whose violent side he hadn't seen in this form before. He also threw a telling look towards the door they had just left out of, and he said it. Maybe another time, Hyverty said, paddling back from her earlier grand announcement. For now, we've got work to do. Rapri laughed. Yeah, let's get to work. <laughs>